Hello, I'm going to do a quick video today just um, talking about scabbards really and how to make a sort of cheaty reenactment one that will look fine from the outside but how the scabbard core can be made a little bit easier if you're not great at woodwork. So I'll, uh, I'll pull this bad boy apart and we can have a little look at it. So what I've basically got here is several bits of thin wood. Now ideally you want something like a bit of poplar or willow and honestly you can get yourself on eBay and look for some thin laths that are already three, four, five millimeters thick. I think these are about four. That'll be perfect. One common mistake with reenactment scabbards is they tend to look like you're about to head off on a, a kayaking expedition down the Hudson River. So you've got a cricket bat strapped to your leg, whereas the real things are really quite small and slender. So hence the reason you want thin wood, three or four millimeters is plenty. Cut a shape out that will cover your blade. Like that, with a little bit of gap. Somewhere between seven to ten millimeters around the edge. That's plenty. Is that, I mean, that's ten millimeters is generous. This is about seven, I think. And give yourself a little bit of room at the point. Don't feel like you've got to cut it so close. This will also help if you want to fit a uh, shape on the end of it. Because if you try and fit the shape to here, right where the sword tip is, you're going to struggle to fit proper sized shapes onto the scabbard itself because proper sized shapes are very small that's why you commonly see reenactment people making these big fat oversized shapes um, because they're trying to fit them over the very very tip here whereas if you're fitting it from this point downwards you've got a lot more room obviously to, to sculpt the sword scabbard so the originals are normally two bits of wood like this one here maybe a bit fatter, that have been hollowed out uh, with a chisel and, and shaped so they have a kind of uh, curved profile like that and they sit either side of the blade. But you can do this with modern power tools and stuff if your woodwork's not that great by having one flat piece either side and then if I just take the sword out here we can see that what I've done here is glued on the back of another piece the same side I've glued one or two strips to build up the thickness. There we go. And all I've done here is cut thin straight laths and glued them directly on. You can even make pieces up like this, you know, make make the section up as it needs to be. Slot that in there. You know, so just make it up with chunks, it doesn't really matter. Just put plenty of glue on, tight fit, clamp it all up and leave it. Now what I did with this one, because one thickness wasn't quite enough for the thickness of the sword blade, I stuck one solid one on, and then I stuck a second one on, but I then took this surface here and belt sanded it. So I basically glued two on and then it, that was too thick so I just sanded off a surface on a belt sander and I kept matching it to the saw blade until this covered the saw blade to lift a little bit of room. Now this one I'm not going to line, um, a lot of reenactors don't. If you want to line it with sheepskin or some textile or some other um, fur because um, a lot of IDs are very flaky on the linings of scabbards then you will need to allow a little bit more and the best way to do this is to prepare your scabbard whether you're carving it or whether you're doing it the cheaty method prepare your scabbard first lay your sword in it with the textile around it push it in and make sure there's enough room for that now if you lay the textile in it with the um, textiles itself the, the, the fibres pointing down the blade these will actually bind the blade so you can tip the blade up with the textile in it and it won't fall out. So it can be quite a useful feature but of course because it's textile you can still draw it very easily. Um, so that's basically it. All you need to do, two pieces, glue the lath side to side, make sure the sword can draw in and out and give it a tiny bit of room because otherwise as the wood kind of get bound, gets bound and shrinks it can, uh, it can get stuck in there quite easily. And then I'm going to put a little bit of glue down the edge here, put this over the top and then clamp this one up. Um, and leave it to dry. When I've done that, uh, we're going to shape the scabbard itself because obviously it does not want to be a flat plank like that. Um, so I'll glue this all up and then I'll come back and show you how I'm going to shape it. So you can see now this has been glued up that the scabbard, even with all three thicknesses, really doesn't protrude much. Either side of the hilt, and the hilt's fairly narrow. And that's what we're looking for. So the next plan of action will be using some kind of mechanical sanding device just to curve these corners off here to make the scabbard 
tapered towards the edges. Now, yes, it can get quite thin here, but actually the original scabbards can often be as thin as that all the way around the wood on it, so it should be more than fine. And I'll probably take a little bit off the surface here too. So I'm going to do that now um, on a mechanical sanding device, a bit of big belt sander, and I'll show you that when it's finished. So you can see that's now been done. The edges have been rounded off roughly. Um, I normally take a bit of an angle off each one equally on something like a disc sander and then just slowly bevel the edges. It probably still wants a little bit more work on it, but for now, for starters, that'll do. Uh, I've done that all the way down the length, but I have left the tip alone, so that's still its chunky mess of itself. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to mark out where the shape needs to belong. Well, the best way to do that is to actually get the sword blade placed on the scabbard. So you've got a rough idea of where the sword is internally. So you've got lots of room to play around with that now. And then ideally what we need to do is mark the centre line and then mark the shape of the shape, bodum tish onto the wooden scabbard itself. Now remember the wooden scabbard needs to be smaller than the inside of the shape because there will be leather covering it eventually. So I'll do that and come back and show you the finished thing. Right, so here we go. As you can see here, I've marked the center line, I've marked the tip of the sword, and I have marked the edge of where the shape inside is with this pencil. Probably about there somewhere-ish. But you'll see now when I remove it, I actually have wood falling far short of that. That's largely because there'll be leather over the top and actually the inside of this will be so narrow and small that we'll get nothing in there of any worth. So what we need to do now is do the same that way um, and mark out how much it'll want thinning. So I'll do that first. So there we go. This is the where this, the shape will meet. So the entire thing will want thinning down by a few millimetres at least to here. And then it'll want thinning down to about five millimetres maximum at the tip. So I'll probably just uh, chamfer a, a straight line between these two to start with. Um, because again, the blade tip's coming to here, so we can afford to go incredibly thin up to this point. And we'll see what that looks like. So there we go. I had to redraw on the shape because I'd sanded it off, but I've thinned it down a slope from just behind this line. Now, now what I'm going to do is take the corners off this, so like I did with the main body of that, make it more oval shape, um, and probably add a an increased sort of radius taper on this bit here just round it off a little bit more so it's and start to use this once I've done that I'll start to use this to you know basically get the shape to fit um, which means there may be a little bit of a step in this I don't know we'll see so this still isn't finished yet I'm going to need to take a lot more off I actually ended up taking a lot more off the sides and off this surface than I anticipated um, and I'm going to do a load more too and we'll have to thin it down back up to here to get a taper in, take this down a chunk more and I'm going to need to take some more of these sides here. Now we know there's plenty to go out because of this material here but that's going to involve basically just taking the, it back up to here as a bit of a taper between here and here, thinning that down a bit and then doing the same with this and then once again rounding these edges off to tidy them up. So I'll, I'll do that and come back but you see we're starting to get there um, and you know, we can get it to fit the wooden scabbard we just need to give a bit more room to allow the um, the leather in yet but you can see the actual um it's starting to get there now so we'll keep going so very quickly just to show you I have sanded that at the crude stage I would normally do this all as one but I figured I'd show you what I was doing so I'm sanding I've sanded this off and I've sanded the sides off and you can see it's gone from having a round profile to a very square one now and I'm doing that to get the shape. I've also started to get rid of that pointy tip because it's not necessary really and it's not the shape of most uh, shapes. They tend to be rounded. As it incidentally do a lot of the uh, fairly intact sword tips that I see. You see a lot of very pointy sword tips in reenactment and actually the real ones tend to be a lot more like that. Rounded. On sharp ones of course, the uh, blunt reenactment swords are incredibly rounded. So that's better. Now if I hollow, if I round the edges off a little bit more, uh, get rid of those, and we'll see how that fits now. It's getting there. It may need a bit more still, but you can see we do have a good gap now in both sides. 
Probably need a bit more of this face though, so I'll probably take a bit more of the flat face. Okay, well, I think we're done. Uh, we managed to thin it off loads, get it all down there, and it goes right. It actually goes right in to the very tip of the shape now. And this shape is one I've uh, made myself, uh, based on one of the few Anglo-Saxon style shapes that have been found. Um, and it's actual size, so I haven't enlarged it like a lot of the ones in reenactment now, so this is the same size as the original. You see now it goes right to the end, there's a little bit of room, but actually it won't sit right at the end, it'll sit a little bit further back. The main thing is, this is actually loose on the end, see it rattles, which is good. Now when we get the leather on there, uh, we should be able to sew the leather on nice and tight, and then hammer this shape over the end of it uh, to fit. And uh, the blade itself still comes to there, so the shape will cover the tip quite nicely, and it should fit great. I, I'm probably going to push this on about that, f that far. I mean, just a bit shy at the end, I suspect, when it's done. Um, and as you can see then, the main thing you're looking for, of course, is just that there's room. So when you put this on, not quite to the end, you need there to be room all around. So obviously that's where your leather's got to go, so let's see if I can move this around. Apologies for the retching, juicing camera work. But there you go. This is plenty of room. There's a good one and a half millimetres all the way around. Now, of course, if you're using extra thick leather, uh, don't. But if you decide that you want to anyway, because you somehow think it's going to be easy, then you'll have to leave more room. But scabbard leather tends to be very, quite thin, so between one and two millimetres is more than adequate. So, well, one obviously is on the, the sort of thin average side, one and a half, two is on the thicker side, so that's more than enough. But now we've done that, uh, I'm going to put a a slide over the mouth end and then we can get on with the leather work next. So I, I'll show how I'm going to do the slide. There are lots of theories about slides, of course in 9th, 10th century scabbards the slide actually sits here on the, outs on the outside of the woodwork like that and the leather covers the entire lot so you don't see it affixed to the outside of the leather or the linen covering now um, we don't really know what they're made of because we've actually only found them uh, basically as you know impressions on the outer leather cover which has been removed uh, it could be that they're integral that's entirely possible that this one this piece of wood was just carved as one with a, a bridge over it uh, it's entirely possible that they've been made of the materials, sometimes the staining on the leather suggests it might have been made of copper alloy, um, maybe made of bone, uh, highly likely that all three, four options were used because that's people in it. One person has an idea, somebody thinks the other way is better way of doing it. So I'm going to make a wooden one and I'm just going to position it where I want it. I'm going to glue it on the outside and I'm going to fasten it over. It's also worth noting on the original scabbards, they're not actually as high as a lot of reenactors do them. A lot of reenactors have them sticking off nearly an inch from the scabbard board. They're not. They're, they tend to, the embossed impressions on the leather is actually much lower. You only really need enough room to get a, a belt or, a, you know, perhaps even a strap end or something through there. And then that's fine. As long as there's clearance for that, you don't need this great monstrosity sticking off the face. Uh, most of the work is done by, again, with the whole scabbard, the work is done by a combination of the wood and the leather same with shields you know these are very clever composite technologies they're not the strengths all the wood the strengths all the leather they're actually the strength is the wood and the leather in the same way that you know things made of carbon fiber draw their strength from the composite properties of the materials that are making it up so i'm going to make one of these stick it on the outside and then i'll show you that quickly and then it'll be on to leather work and so there we go made a little slide here that's obviously just going to be glued on the surface there's more than enough clearance there, it's perhaps even a bit, a bit over large, but it's fine. And what clearance, what height have we got there? 11 mil, 10 mil, something like that. So that's more than enough, half an inch is plenty. You can see there's plenty of wood there, again a lot of the work's going to be being done by the outer covering of leather as well, so that could possibly have been a bit narrower, that could possibly have been a bit thinner, but it's fine. So job done. Just a case of gluing that on there. So we have some leather here for the scabbard 
and it's as simple as I've laid it on there away from any holes and I've put a mark on this edge and I've rolled it over and up again and I'm going to cut this a little bit extra I'm going to leave you know another inch on top of that easily so make it a little bit extra wide you can mess around cutting a pattern if you really want to um, out of fabric or something else but to be honest I just prefer to cut a strip that I know will cover both sides and on top of that another you know down here somewhere another inch or so and then when I've cut that out I'll show you the next stage so that's it cut out plenty of room to play either end and with the excess of course we'll be trimming this right back to basically here eventually and this will be trimmed up fairly close to but again there's no point right now so the next stage is I'm going to soak the leather stretch it tight and clamp it on one side and leave it to dry so what I'll do is I'll, I'll soak this leather down I'll stretch it around and put some clamps all along the back and then I'll come and take a few quick pictures to show you so that's it for now as tight as I can get it for now. I've left the tip, not going to worry about too much about these end until later. So that's it, clamps off. And that's basically finished now. Um, wear it and enjoy. Now, um, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to take a sharp knife and I'm going to trim fairly close to here all the way along the spine, which hopefully I've tried to make it as central as possible. Hopefully it should start to be the foundation of the seam at the back. So uh, I'll trim all the excess off first and we'll have a look. So I've trimmed it pretty close. Now there's about 5 mil, something like that. I've still left plenty spare at this end. There's a good half an inch there. And this other side, I've trimmed it fairly close. For now that'll do. We'll sort that out later. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to mark along this edge here. I'm going to mark a fairly straight line all the way down and just cut that off flush with the edge completely. So you go, that's a line marked all the way along. It's not perfectly in the centre, I don't think, and it's not perfectly straight, but I mean, if you've ever seen any real early medieval scabbards, you won't worry too much about that. Right, so there we go. I took the scabbard core out, I cut this with a knife, and I've put it back on again. So um, basically what we're going to do now is we're going to Mark these two bits, pull these bits tight together and just mark this second one so there's a fairly neat matching edge so they just touch each other, maybe a little bit short all the way along and then cut that one neat so that they just meet like this all the way and that's after then we're going to punch the holes in with the awl and start stitching. So I find this bit a little bit easier by clamping down one edge and then folding this loose edge, the second edge we're going to trim over, like here. I've cut it quite tight, so already it just touches, which is perfect how we want it. There's some overlap here. There's overlap all the way down everywhere else. Uh, it's a little bit short here. Now, if it is a little bit short, is it short? Yeah, it might be a couple of mil short. It will stretch a little bit, but if it is, um, at this point, you can actually just go back on the belt sander and take a little bit off the edges of the scabbard. You will only need an odd millimetre off to allow the gaps to close up, so you can do that then. But what I would do is I would go along now and just overlap these two bits and mark on the edge where it wants cutting. And then this should, when I take this off, I should have a... Sorry, sorry you didn't see that, but basically I'm just marking this edge here where it meets the, the straight edge and then that's where basically we're going to trim um, this bit too, we can take the whole thing off and cut it again we should be able to join the dots up and give ourselves a nice edge to work to and then when we trim that, that's when it's a case of punching the oil holes So I'm currently punching the holes with the awl. I've just decided to randomly do them at sort of five, six mil intervals all down the edge. 
and all I'm doing is I'm punching in from this side here at an angle diagonally down and through and that's coming out if I can flip it on the other side like these and this is between three and five millimeters back from the edge get it back in focus there so I've got diagonal holes running from the edge through to the flesh side I've done this on both edges and you can see I'm basically this is very thin leather it's one on one to one and a half mil probably closer to one than one and a half um, basically I'm gonna I'll obviously stitch it up afterwards but this will be completely hidden you'll see when we when we actually stitch the the seam itself will be entirely internal so I'm just punching uh, all in the holes first just to get them somewhere near and I'm doing it while the leather's damp. Now I originally just gently damped the whole front face of the leather. I've done this one side and it's slowly starting to dry out so I just keep re-wetting this bit. But if I make it all wet and just let it all dry I shouldn't get it too many watermarks in it whereas if I just keep wetting one edge it can make it horribly patchy. Um, so I'll finish this off and then start stitching. So I thought it was worth a quick note on the old technique I use. What I tend to do is put the leather with the flesh side down onto a, a pad or a mat or another piece of leather and then I'll push the awl into the side just a little bit and I actually put my finger on top and then push the awl right in as far as I want it to go. Now I can feel with the pressure of my fingertip the um, awl tip itself working its way into the dampened leather using this technique and then right at the end I can lift the awl up and come out the other side and I find that this prevents me tearing it now what I'll then do is just um, turn the leather over and just work the old tip back into the same hole like this. just wiggle it a little bit to open that hole up and I'll go back once I've done about 10, 10 20 holes I'll go back and do that with all of them um, whilst the leather's still damp. You find that when the leather's damp there's much less risk of tearing and this opens the holes up nicely for sewing and also gives you a um, a nice all mark on the the exit point so you can see where these um, these are for stitching later too. So, stitching time. So I've got some thread here. I've put a knot on the inside through to here. I'm going to go from the outside through to the inside. So I half think that this is the way I did last time. I'm going to pull this one up tight. Don't worry too much about the first one, but you'll find, you'll notice I've got the thread damp. I'll probably just have a little bit of a fettle around with this one. You'll find I should be able to pull that quite tight, nearly close. Don't worry about the first one, just get the first few stitches in and get them as close as you can. Now. I'm going to do the same, I'm going to go across here and in on the inside and the flesh side, which means peeling this back open and getting a couple of stitches in. But you'll find that what I'm doing is I'm doing a, a continuous sinew stitch like that, all the way up, and then pulling it. Once I've done three or four, you can pull it all tight and it should just tighten up along the seam. I'm going to get it reasonably tight to start with. Now, this this will mean that I can close the seam up almost completely. And again, because it's damp, the leather should stretch as I'm doing it. So by all means, feel free to pull the two bits together as much as you can and then tighten them up afterwards. Once you've got a, an inch or so done towards the center, I tend to just do a little bit towards the center and then work my way towards one end and finish off and then come back to the center, put another knot in and then head in the other direction. Just pulling it tight as you go. So I'll do a little update once I've done an inch or so and we'll see how that looks. Okay, so here's what's happening here basically. Each time I'm coming in the back and through. And I'm going in this end grain here. It's coming out into the flesh at the back. Apologies because I'm doing this one handed and struggling to. It's actually very easy two handed, but 
holding a camera steady while you're doing it, it's not great. And then of course for this one, I need to come in the back, so I usually find the easiest way to do that is to just poke the needle in the hole you want to come out of, just to find the reverse hole. And then come back in this way, there you go. set to go again. Oh, it's just getting tangled up on these clamps. I'm just using these clamps to keep the uh, to keep the um, scabbard in position while I'm stitching these first few. They're not unnecessary, they just make it a bit easier. And of course each time I've done a stitch or two I'll pull the threads up tight. But I won't worry too much if they slacken off. I'll just make sure once I've done every three or four I'll tighten them up. And what I'm going to do now, this is a little bit loose here, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pull these apart. I'm going to pick these threads out individually and just tighten this last one up a tiny bit more although I can to be fair I can tighten this once I start again from this end I can pull a knot tight there and it's fine but these will all pull up you know once I've done that these will all pull up com completely closed so I'll do a, a whole section and show you what it looks like so you can see I've stitched from here all the way up to the top now not perfect um, I'll come back and burnish this and tidy it up later but now I'm just going to start again here and stitch all the way to the tip and I'll stop just about here somewhere and start to mould and shape this into fit so I'm going to stitch all the way down here I mean that took about 20 minutes something like that so it's it's a fairly quick process and then uh, yeah, final one I'm going to do the tip so the final section here um, I sew it all the way up. Again, I've still not pushed and burnished this down, but the final section here I'm going to do is just do it two or three holes at a time and pull it really, really tight and just trim any excess as I go, basically. With a little bit of water on this, I'll be able to um, pull it nearly closed. There may be a little bit of a gap, but on this particular example, I'm not going to worry because the shape's going to go over it. But um, if you didn't have the shape, you'd definitely want to make sure you soak the end and really stretch the leather. It, this has... Uh, as daft as that sounds, that will pull up with, with when the leather's wet and with the thread holes through there. And you can pull quite hard on these. Um, as long as you've all pierced back to, you know, four or five mil back from the edge, you can pull quite hard. They're remarkably strong. But, uh, yeah, that basically, that basically is it. So I'm going to stitch this up, and then the next thing I'm going to be doing is dyeing the leather. Um, I just use a modern dye. Um modern fibings die but um, I might record it just if anybody's interested and that's mostly to try and match some of the colours of historic dyes a little bit better so historic leather is a little bit better because this tends to be a little bit pale when it's finished so so I've kind of just given up on this at the end there pulled it as tight as I could and then not worried about it because I know it's got to be hidden normally I'd spend a bit more time but I just gave up really to be honest especially by the time I've dyed it it's all going to be covered the final thing to do is just to take my burnisher and just work it down this seam here to flatten it all down. You'll also find you can start to push this seam closed a little bit with it, you know, just while the leather's still damp. And all these flat bits here, all these sort of bits here can be flattened out fairly easily with that. Just with them, um, just by working it over. And that should get rid of most of the puckers and things out of it. And that's it.